average and it is $25 for non-members. Today's webinar is titled Train Like You Fight Stress Inoculation Training and Performance Enhancement in EMS Students presented by Thomas Nagel, Program Director and Manager for the Center for Pre-Hospital Medicine, Department of Emergency Medicine at Atrium Health. I'm going to pass it over now to Thomas. Thank you so much for being here today to share your knowledge and experience with us and we look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Ria, I appreciate it. And thank you everyone in attendance today. It's an honor to talk to all of you. Um, and today I wanna break down um, an overview of, of what I hope to, to get through and really where my passion was instilled uh, for this subject matter. So stress inoculation training uh, is something that I feel like has been uh, a, a part of uh, my career throughout all of EMS and military. I was a former army combat medic, um, was a paramedic crew chief in an urban system here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and have now been an educator for the last uh, 12 years and recently took over as director for the Center for Pre-Hospital Medicine in uh, Charlotte as well. And we are pretty unique in that we're a consortium program. Um, all of our faculty is uh, employed by the hospital system here, Atrium Health. Uh, we all work for a level one trauma center, and we have a great partnership with Central Piedmont Community College, um, where they provide the facilities um, and equipment, and we provide um, the faculty and then the oversight and uh, ability to get access to um, the hospital, which as everyone knows in education has been uh, quite a challenge. So th the reason this became a passion, of course, is that I think stress inoculation um, has been a part of everyone's training. I think we've all gone through it, um, but I think that we've had some trials and tribulations along the ways, both students and educators. Uh, and the question is, are we deploying this right? Uh, what do we think is, is really in inducing of stress and does it make better providers? Um, where this really got captivating is that we in our program have a great deal of uh, physician interaction. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, one of the country's best EMS fellowships uh, come through Atrium Health, as well as a lot of participation with emergency medicine residents. Um, so something came across my desk about two years ago where the residents are tasked with doing a research project. Um, and two residents came, I'll speak about them a little bit more, uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Cravens and Dr. at the time, Kelsey Lena, now Craver, uh, came to me and said that they were interested in conducting a stress uh, induction study or inoculation study. So of course my ears perked up and said, this is something that um, we've implemented and would love to just see some results in applying the study. So the goal of today's presentation is one to specifically talk about the study um, that we went through in our last year's paramedic cohort and some takeaways, uh, what we found, um, it was a good proof of concept, and then how it can be applicable in the classroom um, and what you all can do to take, I think, what we learned and, uh, and see if you can implement it and get some positive results with your students. So uh, we say train like you fight. I'd love for y'all to be participatory in the chat. I'm monitoring that. Um, some of it will be questions and really I love to just hear insight from you all. Um, but what does that phrase mean to you? So I'll give you a, a moment. I'm just gonna pause for a second and, and let y'all answer in the chat. I would love to uh, to hear from my peers on, on what does train like you fight really mean? How do we implement that uh, in the classroom for our students? As I'm kind of waiting for some of the chats to come in, um, I feel like my own opinion, my own thoughts of this have changed uh, over the years. Uh, so make scenarios as real as possible. I, I absolutely agree with that. Make training as real as possible with simulations. I don't fight very well, that's funny. Uh, and use the same situations and equipment. That's absolutely true. Um, so I feel like we can't sandbox things, make it real. Um, these are great, exactly what I'm thinking. Uh, take, them, take them out on the lab, be realistic. Uh, take a call and recreate it is a good one. Of course, we ought to be cautious that we don't, you know, turn that into to war storytelling. Um, you know, don't stage equipment, which is good. Uh, I see put the student in, in a, a good environment. Exactly. I love, uh, Mike, what you said, and we're going to speak on that. Put them in stressful situations and we'll resort to memory, how you're trained. Uh, we're absolutely going to bring that up. Uh, and the Army was a culture. And you're right. And, and, and again, being prior service military, even there, it was done well at times. And, uh, and sometimes was not done so well. Are we doing something that's stressful just for the sake of being difficult or, or hard or does is there a purpose to it? And I think that's the biggest thing is really planning backwards and having that obje objective. Um, so I love a lot of these answers. Um, so, so the realistic scenarios, absolutely. Um, I think we're all on the same page with that. So what it's not, 
what is it not? Um, and so I want to see if I can expose any of my uh, my my closet uh, trekkies in in the room. Uh, does anyone know what this is? The Kobe Ashu Maru. We'll really see. Um, we'll kind of have a throwback here and and and, and kind of weed out uh, our folks. The no one scenario. Absolutely, the impossible to pass. Yep, it was a it was a test given to uh, Captain Kirk. I have to admit, I'm not a Trekkie, but um, it was the impossible no win scenario. And how often have we either been one victim of this, or have we uh, been the perpetrator of giving these students a type of scenario that they can't get through? And I think early on as an educator, I thought that was stress inoculation. I thought that if we just keep adding to them and, uh, okay, well, now you recognize this, but you failed to realize they just came back from a dive trip in Belize and they have, you know, the bends. And yeah, you caught the trauma. Um, I think that a big part of realistic scenarios is that they have wins. And uh, while we train so much for what I call the halo, the high acuity, low occurrence calls, we sometimes do need to make sure that we're concentrating on the lower acuity fundamental skills in our training and that the scenarios that we give should not be the impassable test. Um, it's my opinion that we should have, of course, a plan if the student doesn't go through the treatment objectives and that in that case, they might deteriorate or go down a clinical pathway. Um, and if they do it correctly, that they need to get wins sometimes. That's just as much learning. Um, so what I, what I don't believe stress inoculation is, is constantly giving the impassable test. And I'm going to show a quick video. I hope the audio comes through on it. Uh, I now show this to almost all of my students. One that's comical, but uh, I think we can relate to. So if you haven't seen this one, we'll pause. It's pretty quick, only about a minute and 30 seconds um, to, to play this. And I'd share this with your students as well if they haven't uh, seen this one before. All right, you arrive on scene. You have a 38-year-old male, chief complaint of not feeling well. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, sir. How are you doing today? Uh, so what's going on? Yeah, he says he hasn't been feeling well for a while now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get your patient's dead. Wait, what? He's dead? Your patient had a three-foot katana sword sticking out of his back that you failed to find during your initial assessment. Oh, come on. How, wait, how am I supposed to find that? Also, you're dead. Wait. I'm dead? Yep, there was a second victim in the house who's been huffing paint in a vacuum-sealed room for the last two days, and he stabbed you for the highlighter that you had in your pocket. What? I'll tell you what, new scenario. You arrive on scene, patient's in full respiratory arrest. Okay, he's in respiratory arrest. I'm going to go ahead and grab my airway bag and innovate him. Can't innovate him. There's an octopus on his face. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going I'm to pull the octopus off. The octopus has been trained in the art of anti-pulling. You can't get him off. I'm going to get my I'm gonna get my scalpel. I'm going to get my scalpel and I'm going to cut it off. You can't get the scalpel out. Your partner has glued the airway bag shut. Why would he do it that? It doesn't matter. What are you going to do? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You arrive on scene to a house with six vehicles in the driveway, a patient with a chief complaint of abnormal labs and just needing a ride to the hospital because it's faster via ambulance. I'm going to assist him into the ambulance and give him a ride to the hospital. Great job. You passed. Awesome. Being a medic is going to be easy. Is that anyone's first time uh, seeing that one? I think we can all relate to that on, on again, both sides right, of uh, on both sides of being a student and an educator. <clears throat> I love that guy too. He's uh, doing incredible work. So the uh, overview here, I'll give you an outline too. And again, initially we'll talk about the study and then I'd really like to collaborate with you all to talk about applications as we move down. So I'll give you a little bit further on the background of how this came about. Um, talk to you a bit about the study design, um, what, what our intentions were, uh, and then reveal what the findings of the study were. Um, the application, I've kind of moved it, so forgive me, I'll move that towards the back because I want that to be more of a, a discussion amongst us and what we can do uh, to bring this to you all so that you can have some takeaways to bring to your students. I'll give a summary of, uh, of the study and um, the discussion points that we had amongst ourselves as investigators. And then also, of course, want to give credit to the contributors uh, that I mentioned previously um, and uh, then want to open it up for really questions and any further comments or discussions. I love what I'm seeing in the, the chat already. I really got, appreciate you all um, participating like this. So a brief background then. So what is stress inoculation training? So it's a teaching model to build resiliency. I love that word. That word resiliency and mental health uh, has become uh, kind of a buzzword, um, but I really think that's what we need. All too often we're talking about and I feel like um, I'm becoming the older generation. We say kids these days and this generation. Um, and what I mentioned to them, right, is like, hey, we almost talk about EMS like it's going to be going to Normandy. What we don't tell them, it's more going to be like the scene in Saving Private Ryan. When you get there and the 
ramps lower, EMS is going to be rough. And you need to have methods to be more resilient. Um, you are going to experience stress. Now, what will you do with that stress and uh, how can you mitigate it and properly reduce it is, is important. So training these techniques for hyperarousal and stressful situations, how to remain calm, uh, to keep good focus. Um, and that's what th this is all about. So the objective for us was to evaluate the effectiveness of stress inoculation training using objective measures and, and subjective measures in the stress of paramedic students through utilizing heart rate monitoring. And we'll talk about that more specifically in our methods on that. So looking in other research before developing this study, uh, we realized that SIT had not been previously studied or published in pre-hospital education specifically, but it is well studied in other disciplines, specifically uh, military, uh, fire, and police um, with si similar data to what we found. I would consider this kind of, uh, if you haven't read this book as an educator, it's one that I, I definitely recommend. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman uh, writes two books, uh, one on combat, and he has a second um, that he discusses the physiological responses of stress to combat veterans. Um, and a big takeaway is something that uh, I think it was Mike or someone mentioned in the chat that so the sense of personal effectiveness and self confidence created by realistic training is as much a stress reducer as when the muscles go into autopilot. So we talk about that all the time. And we talk about phases and um, getting our students to go to muscle memory. Um, but what someone mentioned, and I'm a big believer on, is you will resort to your lowest level of training in crisis. And we all, myself included, like to think that we will uh, resort to our highest level of training, which uh, simply is not true. Um, there's an anecdote, and I'll sh share it quickly. Uh, I didn't have it built in here, but it's one also. There's several things now that I talk to my students about every time, and it's an example of um, a couple that was moving to Washington, D.C., and uh, they knew they were moving to a high crime area, so they had bought uh, what's called a rubber ducky in the military or kind of a simulated uh, weighted pistol, and uh, they were practicing some Israeli special forces training called Krav Maga, in which the husband and wife would approach one another and learn how to disarm uh, someone in the fact, in the case they'd ever been mugged, that was pretty prevalent in the area they were moving to. And they trained on this for almost uh, an hour every night for six or seven months and become very proficient um, in doing this. In different situations, the wife would even get into to acting and say, well, so I'm, I'm pregnant, please don't, don't hurt me. Um, and when the husband would pull the, the, the dummy weapon and she would learn how to take it away from him. Uh, well, unfortunately, you can look this up, and I believe it was in the Washington Post. I can put a link if I find the uh, the news article that these two souls were unfortunately mugged um, about six or seven months after moving to that location. And someone came up behind their back and uh, and, and held a real weapon to them. And of course, their uh, their training kicked in, and they turned around and they were able to disarm the perpetrator. Right? They, they were able to go and grab the gun away like a perfect uh, crane. Grab the gun. Here's my question to you. What did they do next? They, they got the gun effectively away from the perpetrator, but if you think how they trained every night, what did they do next? Yeah, several of us probably heard this story or can, can just assume based on this, right? I'm, I'm seeing a lot of you getting it correct. My students usually said, oh, they, uh, they shot him or no, that's not what happened. Everyone's getting it right. They handed it back. They handed it back to the perpetrator. So had you heard that or just, you know, again, watching paramedic students and EMT students for a while, you can kind of assume that they resorted to their training. That was their muscle memory. Um, that's where they became comfortable because they would continue to practice that scenario. And uh, they were taken for everything. So the perpetrator there completed mugging them and uh, luckily spared their lives so that they could tell that story, um, which again is real. And I, I bring that up as an anecdote. I call that a training star and um, say that it's it's difficult, especially if you've been in the field for a while. Uh, our department also trains um, for Mecklenburg County EMS here regionally, and experience uh, level of the providers coming through our new hire academies varies from brand new to 25 years. And I'll tell you that it's even harder, I think, to rid those bad habits in the more experienced personnel and, and make them recognize that they're carrying these training scars with them. Um, and there's a lot of uh, ego and pride sometimes that has to to uh, be over, overcame to, to really rid ourselves of those training stars. And again, I'm certainly uh, accountable to that myself. So what is stress inoculation training then? How do we prepare folks? So stress inoculation is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which I'm a big believer in. There's a lot of evidence supporting uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for a number of different uh, mental health issues. 
the goal of, of this, this training is to help individuals cope and manage their stress. And it does involve gradually exposing them to stressful situations. So it's not like we can just go in and tomorrow start to employ this um, and, and expect that we're going to have benefit from it. So it happens in stages and we'll discuss that. So the coping strategies are taught to improve that resilience that we mentioned and reduce negative responses to stress. And so we sought to find out how can that be measured? And again, we'll talk about the objective and subjective uh, data points that we use to analyze that. So the training is divided into three different phases. Uh, the first is a conceptualization, excuse me, a conceptualization and education about stress and what it is. Um, the next would be skill acquisition and then rehearsal of the coping techniques. And then the last would be application and practice of skills in real life situations. So we did modify this some just based on our training. And so I'll tell you how we did this uh, in our study, which is in phase one, um, we had a baseline in which we wanted to see what the initial stress of paramedic students was prior to inducing any education. So we conducted regular scenarios. We didn't even really tell them what our mission was. We had given them no education. Of course, these were voluntary participants. Um, and I'll tell you about the numbers, but we had 34 students initially enrolled in our course and asked them to participate uh, voluntarily. Um, and of course said that we would not release any uh, private health information or personal health information. We did ask that any students that were on uh, stimulants um, would uh, either one, volunteer to participate, uh, again, because this was heart rate data. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, uh, the the difficulties that we encountered based on that. So uh, running just some standard scenarios and just collecting data about heart rate variability and heart rate, which we'll talk about. Phase two was uh, simply the education. So two of the investigators, Dr. Cravens, Dr. Lena at the time, uh, came in and did a presentation uh, on a lecture on stress and the physiological responses to it. And um, really, it goes hand in hand with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman's book in which he mentions for combat veterans. And as we all know, you, there are several major physiological responses that we lose peripheral vision, that we lose our finite uh, and fine motor skills, um, that uh, our thinking process uh, is, is slowed sometimes and we get that tunnel vision. Um, so we wanted to make sure that they were aware of those physiological responses so that they could tell in their survey subjectively if they found those to be reduced. Um, and then we gave them the education about some specific stress reduction techniques um, that I'll mention here shortly. Uh, we did not encourage them, though, in this phase to employ them. So this was just simply the education phase. Um, they could on their own, of course. We didn't pause them from doing it, but they weren't actively encouraged uh, to employ these reduction techniques during um, their scenarios. We just want them to know about stress. And in the last phase was our intervention phase. Here is where we had them ap apply, and we would actually coach them at certain points to uh, utilize the stress techniques that we taught them, stress control techniques. And we started to uh, slowly interject controlled, controlled stressors during the scenarios. Again, not the Kobayashi Maru necessarily. It did go a bit outside of a, of a standard uh, stressor though, because we wanted to see how they would respond. But we also found just based on the dynamics of, of how we ran this, um, was there, some, there were probably some uh, extrinsic stressors that we didn't initially plan for. So some of the uh, subjective measures of stress uh, were surveys. So the students were told that two minutes um, prior to, uh, correction, 10 minutes prior to a scenario, they would be seated for a two minute time frame. And we utilized what's known as the NASA TLX survey. And uh, this survey really asked them about their readiness, um, their current stress response, um, their confidence levels going into the scenario so that we had a pre and post uh, subjective measurements. Um, so we got this at baseline and conducted these surveys through all three phases. Um, and within two to five minutes, one thing that we'll talk about was the timing of this. Uh, of course, as you know, in trying to do rotations, it's almost like herding cats. Um, there were times where we didn't have a, a, a lot to spare so that we didn't delay other students getting reps at, at practice scenarios. Um, so timing wa was an issue. Um, and then we would also survey them, survey them immediately following the simulation uh, while still wearing their heart rate monitor. So we were collecting objective and subjective data simultaneously. They would take a follow-up NASA TLX survey um, as well as just a, a post-survey on, on uh, how they felt their performance was in the scenario. 
for the objective measure of stress, we had them using uh, chest strap heart rate monitors, specifically the one seen here, this polar heart rate monitor. Um, we had explored a couple other options, knowing a lot of our students had uh, smart watches, Apple watches now and Garmin's have some capability to get this data. But for true heart rate variability, um, we found that one, in, the, in order to pull the data, um, and that was above, above my level, uh, to pull and analyze the data into a format that was usable, where we could uh, denote the metrics that we had to use a chest strap. We were looking for two things really. One was a peak in uh, heart rate, and the next thing was heart rate variability, which is a fluctuation in the inner beat interval. And to go further on this, so that heart rate variability is the fluctuation in the time intervals between adjacent heartbeats, and it's been well studied um, in multiple different disciplines in cardiovascular health, athletic conditioning, and uh, really is utilized even things like Garmin watches, if you have one or an Apple watch where it's measuring stress, this is based off of HRV. What the data shows is that greater heart rate variability can indicate that the parasympathetic tone has been used and it's a marker of lower stress. So the more variable between R to R, um, that is really showing a decrease in stress. So previous studies have used these markers in ultra short-term samples. Um, so a lot of R's were being measured over a longer period of time, which again brings into some question statistical validity. Um, and our scenarios tended to run around 25 to 30 minutes, and then also included the pre and post survey time where they were also under heart rate monitoring. Our hypothesis for the, for the study was as, as students gain knowledge and simulation experience, that there would be a decrease in overall heart rate during scenarios and that we would see an increase in heart rate variability, especially over the progressive phases. And that uh, lastly, that we would have a decreased objective stress despite more challenging medical decision-making, and then the planned introduction of intentionally stressful stimuli in the final intervention phase. So before we get to the findings and, and what happened, I'll tell you a little bit uh, to backtrack about what the education was for them and tell you more specifically about what the stress reduction strategies were. So in that education, the 15 minute education presentation about stress, we talked about the physiological respect, uh, effects, but we also mentioned two primary mechanisms that they were taught to employ. Uh, the first of which is tactical breathing and Lieutenant Colonel Grossman also mentions this in his book um, on combat. And the next was OODA loop. And I want to speak about each of these specifically. And uh, to give credit where it's due, OODA loop, the first time I'd heard about it was actually at an MC conference um, a few years back in, uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, forgive me, I don't remember the presenter that discussed it, but it's also another thing now that almost any group of students I encounter um, that I talk to them about, about this concept. Has anyone heard of this before? Um, just curious, give me a, a, a thumbs up or a hand or a comment if you've heard of OODA loop. I think it has a great, op yeah, absolutely. You got it right, Max. Good, awesome, that's awesome. So I feel like it's something that we should really uh, give to our students as well, that not just as educators, that, that we hold on to it, but they're, they're given this to employ it. So if you haven't heard of this or you're not talking to your students about it, I've seen anecdotally before ever running this study, um, that there's something that students really appreciate and that I can just mention it in the middle of a scenario. I can go OODA loop and I'll see them calm. Um, so we'll talk about that in a moment. First, we'll talk about the tactical breathing though. And it's a technique to reduce stress and improve focus in high pressure situations. Um, so it has its, its uh, roots in yoga, which is a funny story because I remember uh, and first hearing about this and, and reading about it and, uh, and on combat in that book and talking to my wife about it and said, hey, I found something, you know, really interesting and it comes from the military. And uh, she quickly uh, slapped me down and said, no, it comes from uh, ancient yoga techniques and has been utilized by um, Asian cultures for uh, thousands of years. So uh, I thought I was onto something new that she, she was well educated about. Um, so controlled breathing, though, and achieving mental clarity and relaxation, and again, activa activation of uh, parasympathetic uh, nervous system, and we'll, we'll discuss how to do this. So it's been used by the military, law enforcement, um, athletes, uh, healthcare professionals, and other disciplines to manage stress and to improve performance. And if I'm being quite honest, I employed it right before starting up this uh, Zoom as I felt my sympathetic nervous system kicking in. So the benefits uh, are showed that studies 
Reveal tactical breathing can absolutely reduce heart rate, uh, reduces blood pressure in the short term, perceived stress levels, which we also found on our surveys, and it increases cognitive performance and decision-making ability. So how do we employ this? We use what's called the square method, and I'm gonna play again another just quick uh, uh, video here of, of how this is employed. And so as I, I'll talk through it as I play it. So what you do is you take a breath in for four seconds. You hold for the four seconds. and then slowly release. So I want you to try it along with the video this time. I'll give a moment for you to do that. So absolutely proven to be effective. And personally, again, anecdotally, I can say it's something that, that I've utilized. Uh, since being educated about it several years ago. For that, it's funny to tell my students to employ that um, a Seinfeld episode, which most of this generation now is just absolutely missing my pop culture references, but I refuse to change. Does anyone else find in that? Um, my biggest metric on that is I always uh, bring up my cousin Vinny uh, quotes, you know, and when they don't know who these two youths are, I know I've lost the crowd, but um, I still entertain myself. So the Seinfeld episode, uh, Back in the day, though, where he says "woo saw," you know, and grabs his ear, is my verbal cue for my students to employ this technique. If I see them kind of losing it and they're in the middle of it without having to intervene or pause them, I just say, "Hey, take a moment, real quick, and woo saw," and it will encourage them to uh, to try this this tactical battle breathing. I love it. Yeah, same. Yeah, I need to start making some of those my uh, my bonus questions. So OODA loop, I saw, I think Max, you had it right. Uh, OODA loop, uh, give credit to uh, Colonel John Boyd in the 1950s. And uh, my understanding of how this came about is that he was one of the most decorated aerial combatants in our military's history. And um, he was in multiple dogfights. And in that day, you know, you didn't last through many. Oftentimes you either were shot out of the sky or you had to eject. And uh, in AAR's after action reviews, um, uh, Colonel Board was interviewed and asked, well, what is it that makes you so different, sir? How are you able to, uh, to, to win against the enemy and engage them? And you haven't been shot out of the sky yet. And he said, uh, well, I'll use my OODA loop. And people said, what the heck is that, of course? And so he said, it's a cyclical process. Um, and his application, and then we'll discuss how it's applied for EMS, was to observe um, so in this case, he would mention how if he had enemy aerial combatants around him. He would simply just take a moment to get get gestalt and look out into the airfield and see how many uh, enemies was he against. So if he noticed that he had three enemies, so, so to speak, the next thing he would do is orient himself. Um, so in orienting himself, he would have to figure out where he was in relation to those uh, three enemies um, and then recognize who was the most critical threat. Um, so that he could move to the next phase, which is to decide. Uh, decide is a big one. Another thing that I start most of my classes with um, is talking about the why there's so many dead squirrels in the middle of the road. Uh, who uses that one too? It's a it's a certainly a, an EMS educator ism. Is why are there so many dead squirrels in the middle of the road? Anyone have that in the chat? They couldn't make a decision, right? They couldn't make a decision. You're absolutely right. So make a choice. And I even tell them, I would encourage students to make the wrong decision. I'd rather you make the wrong decision than to make no decision at all. Please make a choice, right? And we can defend it later. Sometimes students make the, the wrong decision, but for the right reason. Um, but we don't authorize them to, to be stagnant. So you must decide. And in this case, uh, Colonel Boyd mentioned that he made his decision, of course, talking about what the closest threat to him was. So if there was an enemy at 12 o'clock that was the nearest, this decision would likely be uh, to blow them out of the sky first which is the next step is act. You must act. Once you make that decision, you need to move forward with it. So the applicability of the EMS, right? And we'll look at that next is um, that, that framework can be used in all kinds of fields, military strategy, businesses, healthcare, and speed and accuracy really do improve utilizing this skill. So if we look at this from an EMS standpoint then, so observe is 
for me, one, doing a good initial assessment, history and physical, um, and really that's collecting data. So you need data in order to make these decisions. Um, so good observation, um, which all in all, not to get like overly political, we're seeing just so many of these body cam videos and our, our careers being put in a pretty negative limelight. And the most frustrating thing about it is that on each one of these cases, there's no assessment done. Um, and it's, it's just frustrating. That's something that we have a big passion about at the center in my faculty is do an initial assessment every time um, that we just can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. So make your observations so that you can orient yourself and the entire purpose of that initial assessment is to identify and mitigate life threats and the order in which uh, they would increase mortality. So, of course, now the model being changed to an X or CABC is finding and stopping any exsanguinating hemorrhage. If you've observed that first, that's your closest enemy. Um, so you need to orient yourself to that technique, decide how you're going to go about doing that and act upon it. And then, of course, run through that loop. Um, so I'll tell students, sometimes you never get to a, a D disability problem. Sometimes you are stuck in the OODA loop on fixing a C problem. Um, and you continue to do that until you effectively mitigate that life threat. And for me, it's the one thing that, you know, students are in so, such a hurry to get to get through the box check method, so to speak, seeing safe number of patients, they just want to click boxes. And we're really trying to reinforce that sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes you do get stuck in a loop of mitigating a life threat before you can move on, um, which we recommend that you do, um, but not until you have uh, you have gone through this. In, in going through that decision, of course, uh, sometimes there is additional data that's needed to, to make those decisions. So we also challenge them to pause, to formulate a hypothesis and choose a good course of action. Uh, an expression that I say is that while it's emergency medical technician, right, that we lose that, we are trying to develop clinicians that know when there's a bifurcation in the algorithm that they can make a good choice based on risk benefit analysis um, and consider uh, the outcome of what they're about to do um, so that when they act upon it, they can observe those interventions. Um, really found that, um, that this has been a beneficial tool for, again, initial paramedic education and also in folks that are trying to uh, get rid of get rid of uh, some of those training scars that I mentioned. And sometimes it takes exposing that and uh, there's a lot of resistance at times, but then people go, OK, I see the better way that we're not trying to sell snake oil um, and that they can utilize these kinds of tools and they start to adopt them. It's a pretty cool thing to watch. Has anyone else had any experience with uh, seeing positive adaptation uh, or utilization of, of OODA loop? And do you teach it in your classroom? Um, i curious to know uh, your experiences on, on that or the practical breathing. I'll have to check that out, Max. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I don't know that I've heard that one yet. <clears throat> Very cool. Yeah, good, good to see. Um, and definitely like to share these kinds of these kind of things back and forth and see that it's becoming prevalent is, is awesome. So we'll talk about some of the, the controlled stressors that we introduced. Um, and again, these were by design in the interventional phase. And we had talked about talked about this and how we would go about it. So a few, one was missing or broken equipment. And the example of this was uh, we were running the uh, coronary disease type chest pain patient scenario, and then decided that while one of the firefighters um, was removing clothing, that we would have them cut through uh, one of the cables, a four liter or 12 lead cable, and see how they would go about um, mitigating that stress. Um, because again, not everything goes, as we all know, to plan. Um, as a matter of fact, something that I teach them is when we talk about metrics, it kind of based them off Bloom's taxonomy. Um, so I say that again, like level one is, is uh, knowledge. Um, I change it up for EMS a little bit where level two is application. And then I don't go all the way to tier six, but I say level three is the standard of care. Um, what any other paramedic or EMT would be expected to do. And level four to me is critical thinking. I pause and I ask my student, can you define that? How do you become a level four paramedic? How do you do something that's above the standard of care? And I'd also like to throw that out for a minute because it's actually a, a difficult thing and there's no wrong answer to define. So how, how do you define critical thinking or going above the standard? And I'll, I'll share mine in a moment. I'd love to see y'all's opinion on, um, on how you would define that to your students. 
And we even use this metric and this rubric when grading that a level three, so if we have a, a, an evaluation, they're graded on the zero through four rubric and a three is 100%. So it's actually possible to get above 100% on certain areas, but we hold that to a very high weight. It's very rare that we would give out one of those fours. Uh, we make them be, be earned. But how do y'all define critical thinking? I like that. Um, James said uh, adapting to the unexpected. I like that a lot. I'll share mine as, uh, as, as you all come in, um, enables flexibility to so cause and connections. I like that. For me, what I generally have, have come up to as a consensus is one is predictive capability. So predictive capability, meaning that you have, you have to have had experience in this. Every decision we make is based off of, and for me, three things, education, experience, and uh, for alliteration, right, I like to say enteric feeling or gut feeling. And you don't just have those things from day one. So I don't expect my paramedics students to be level fours. It'd be very rare. So predictive capability is one. And then especially I've been teaching the airway class now uh, for several years is that I say the best airway providers have a failure contingency plan. And that comes from predictive capability. It means that you failed before. Uh, and that's going to come to an overview of this entire presentation to you, which is that I think for students, we must embrace and encourage mistakes and just tell them that we thrive off of those, um, that we're looking for those in the classroom. I want them to make every mistake they possibly could in the classroom so that they don't do it on real patients. They don't get the experience the hard ways that most of us have had to um, and can encounter that. And that's learning so that they have predictive capability, that they have a contingency plan. Um, so I, I love the stuff that you said, thinking outside of the box I like, and not cookie cutter. Um, improvised solutions is good, right? That's old military thing, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. So including and interpreting a wide set of data, it's awesome. So anticipating your course is good. And sometimes the important thing to them to know is sometimes it just doesn't work, right? Your, the whole the old school thing of like your patient didn't read your textbook. It's funny. I feel like I'm becoming, you know, my paramedic instructors, like the things your parents used to say to you, um, you say, but that's that's a commonality for me out of my mouth now. Your patient didn't read your textbook. They might not follow all that rule. They, the PE, we talked about yesterday, PEs, and I said, they're not all going to be on a flight, you know, smokers, uh, been on birth control, et cetera. And sometimes it happens to folks not in those boxes. So um, so another so structure there is the missing or broken equipment. It was interesting to see how they encounter that um, because, you know, certainly they, if they understand uh, electrical physiology and electric cardiogra cardiography, could have simply gotten over that by just moving leads um, to, to interpret that. And some of them just absolutely lost it in that moment. And that's when they were told to employ their OODA loop and breathing techniques. And we did see then that some of them were able to come up with a, a correct response to that. But under stress and under duress, um, you know, again, we resort back to our lowest level, which is some of them said, hey, chronic, uh, a critical equipment failure, call for multiple resources, when really that wasn't necessary. They could just bring themselves to center. Uh, the next thing, and this actually was um, sort of planned and unplanned. And what's interesting about this is they actually got very used to it. So just physician presence. And I will highlight our program, very proud of the amount of physician interaction, like I said, because of our EMS fellowship and uh, the third year uh, PGY3 EMS residents come through an EMS month. So almost monthly, if not two times a month, we have positions in our classroom and it has been fantastic. It's probably one, been one of the best things. Um, they, they come in honestly, and if they have no experience with EMS, they usually come in and just want to be a wallflower, but really tell them, Hey, this is symbiotic. Um, as a matter of fact, the question I asked them is I say, Hey, what really grinds your gears when paramedics come into the ER that they're not doing? Like, this is your chance to fix it in initial education. What I usually find by the end of the day is they're all in the scenario trying to give their tips and tricks. And it's really enhanced our clinical experience as well. So our students will get to know um, these physicians and uh, interact with them much more in the ED. When they see them, they'll take them under their wings. I also found for myself too, so I'm interested to hear from you all, how is your physician interaction? Is it something that you would want more of? Um, have you considered reaching out to uh, residency programs in your, your local region to do that? Um, I feel like there's great value. But I've also noticed too, um, just a generational gap. I, mean, I can't tell if it's just me aging again, um, but where I used to be, you know, I was a, a paramedic pretty young in my twenties and uh, I felt like, oh my God, a doctor. And now, you know, being in this almost 20 some years in healthcare with the military, I'm like, wow, these guys really do look like kids. Um, and not that my respect for their education hasn't changed, but I guess it's just a worldview. I don't know if that's, that's natural or just me. 
Um, but th this generation, I'll tell you too, is just so open. I feel like they are just willing to be personable and don't have an ego uh, when they come into our classroom. Um, I don't feel like that was always the case. Just reading through your comments too, um, and, and agree with what what you said, Mike, about permission to fail, stepping back. Yeah, would like more. Absolutely, they interact well. Uh, very little with the students. So I think, yeah, we need to incorporate that and just go up to them. Honestly, I find sometimes that the physicians, these younger generation residents, um, actually interact better, have interpersonal relationships with them even more than some of the other allied health um, staff. So I'll keep keep moving on. So physician presence, again, they actually think was an initial stressor for me. I know my knees used to shake because we didn't get that in my program um, back in the day, but now these guys are calling them by their first name almost. And um, I don't. I didn't find that to be um, uh, a, a major stressor, and the data didn't show that either. And especially because I have a picture here, Dr. Cravens and Dr. Lena were in our classroom so much. Um, it was mutually beneficial. They would take over teaching a lot of the the more advanced skills where I've maybe done it once in my career or never. Um, you know, where they're teaching surgical prikes, um, and they're doing this stuff on a you know bi monthly basis on real world patients. Having that that. Um, that experience level and someone to go, hey, and we get deep into a concept just to turn to them and go, what do you think? Um, they were present almost daily um, during this six month plus phase. So sounds and sirens, that's been well studied and well proven before. And again, we kind of see that that's going uh, the way the dodo bird is, is operationally. We are finally recognizing the, the need for uh, response, the priority one responses and transports are, are decreasing and showing little benefit. Um, but it's been proven even in firefighters and, and police officers that years after or 25 years into a career playing a siren sound will increase heart rate uh, 10 to 20 points and will modify heart rate variability. So we found that as well. Um, and so we want them to have that stress. We have a simulated ambulance in our classroom. And uh, when conducting party one transports, we'll play that uh, siren sound um, to initiate that stress. In addition to uh, non-compliant patients, again, within reason, I feel like it's very uh, easy for this to be taken over the edge. If you're using standardized participants or role players that don't really know where that left and right parameter is, um, it can really turn uh, valuable and good training uh, sideways. So we had very controlled uh, objectives with that with non-compliant patients um, and also would be a, a barrier to it as well as bystanders. Um, and non-compliant bystanders, but there wasn't an end point to that um, where it wasn't taken over the edge. And the other thing was that it was reproducible. Um, so I think taking the time to do that and not giving folks full autonomy um, because then it just kind of turns into a whose line was it anyway um, comedy skit and, and that ruins training. So specific things just about uh, patients not wanting to do certain things uh, or bystanders that had objections. The other thing too I didn't mention here are some cultural things that we've done over the past few years. Uh, is introducing some diversity and just um, uh, some cultural, you know, belief systems. Um, again, we sometimes run one with a uh, um, Islamic or Muslim uh, family in which the the husband uh, is taking the lead stage during an interview and assessment. And again, there is no uh, allegation of abuse or misconduct. This is a cultural issue. And we see how our students deal with that and based on their worldview and, and cultural awareness, um, how they go about that. And that can be a stressor. Uh, and again, sometimes we have just made up, um, made up cultural things that, that we'll just see how students will go about that. Curious to know from you all as well, are you doing any of that? Um, as, as there's an obvious disparity even and, and a lack of, a lack of uh, cultural diversiveness in, in EMS education in our, in our peer group as educators. Um, but I do think it's important that we, uh, that we recognize, uh, recognize that in different cultures and belief systems. Um, even what may be considered abuse, uh, again, by some worldviews, cupping, for example, or um, culture issues is, is another thing that can be a stressor to students. Now, is anyone doing anything um, along those lines or employing that? I can say uh, another thing that we've done, too, is we've started to get um, some different ethnic mannequins, Echo uh, Healthcare, which... Uh, uh, I have no disclosure with, but we've utilized some of their African American mannequins, Hispanic mannequins now, and um, I feel like our students appreciate it too, and it enhances the training um, pretty tremendously. I like that. Yeah, it's including an abuse mimics. Good. Um, <clears throat> I'll keep going on as I, as I watch that come through the chat. It's another kind of a uh, separate thing I'm interested in exploring as well. So, so next thing would be video and audio recording. Um, of course, in the generation that we live in now and uh, seeing all this body cam footage, one just even knowing that they're under video surveillance um, kept them heightened. Um, 
even pulling things out like there would be a bystander, you know, saying world star hip hop and pulling out their phone and uh, saying, no, this is my public right, just to distract them for a moment from that and see how, again, they would mitigate that. Some of the things towards the end that we didn't uh, include as plan stressors, though, were that as this ran through our phases, it actually ran over several didactic model uh, modules, rather. So the first phase where we did um, baselines only was in the airway module. Um, and then we moved into, in the second phase, our next eight-week block was cardiology one. And our third eight-week block was cardiology two, which was our intervention phase. So this ran over three different eight-week modules with different um, content and then different level of expertise. Um, and then we also had them, while their final practical testing, without adding additional stressors to this, we had them surveyed as well. And we also had them surveyed, uh, our students do a mid-program oral board uh, for cardiology specifically. So they'll do two oral boards, a final at the end of the program and one during cardiology. I found that very beneficial to give them interview skills um, and so we had them um, being monitored for oral boards as well. and got some interesting data from that and, 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 and told them to employ those techniques and good interview skills to keep them calm uh, under that type of stress as well. It wasn't a practical hand on, hands on. Uh, the next thing, of course, we talk about is patient death despite treatment, not the Kobayashi Maru, but a planned death. Um, and, uh, and also gave them education. Um, and I want to give a, a shout out again just to another colleague, uh, Emergency Resilience. Uh, on Instagram, if you uh, don't follow um, her, her Instagram, is incredible. And uh, we had that content delivered about how to give proper death notification, um, really good piece of education. And medication errors, uh, medication error by the partner. That was a big planned one. And that was probably, to me, one of the most interesting. Uh, we did it for an anaphylaxis call and had the partner being EMT basic and a planned time when told to give epi um, accidentally gave one milligram, and it was very interesting and bring, bring up a great discussion point and debrief with the students um, about how to handle that, um, how to uh, communicate that and document it, uh, as well as counsel their partner. Um, so also last thing before I move from the slide, I was just curious uh, to see if y'all are doing uh, those sorts of things as well. I saw that you said you do some mass casualty uh, training, Mike, and um, you have a, 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 a bystander that hounds the crew. Yeah, exactly. I like that they calm down when given a task. That's a good thing. I think the big thing is the, that there has to be an, an end point to that. Um, include a lot of material about abuse mimics and stuff that's stepping back there. Good. So our findings from this. Um, phase one, there were high stress levels. And some of it was unfamiliar with scenarios. This did happen in one of the first modules of the class. So there's some things to take in with that. Maybe uh, would have given us more accurate employed this later in the program. Um, there was also a lack of confidence, of course. Everything was just brand new to them. Um, and so they hadn't run scenarios like this in our style. Uh, our mantra to them is train like you fight. So if they were used to box checking, uh, we don't allow that. So if we can't, you know, I say I hate the words I will or I would, you know, no hands in your pocket. If you want to give a medication, you pull that medication out and you show it to us and you check the dates and you go through your R's. Um, these things take time and the timing portion is a big stressor too, we'll mention. In phase two, uh, we noted that there were lower stress levels. Uh, we can't tell exactly, though, if this is due to increased confidence. Uh, they started to get comfort with scenarios, of course. Um, the scenarios are becoming more and more challenging. Of course, the subject matter changed the cardiology during phase two. Um, their knowledge base becomes more solidified. And again, they're becoming aware to their environment, to the position presence we talked about. Um, so we actually saw that their stress levels were highest in phase one uh, and heart rate variability and heart rate revealed that same as subjective. And phase two was actually the lowest. Um, so our hypothesis would be that in phase three, it would have gone progressively lower and lower. But in phase three, uh, there were actually peaks of the highest stress. And I think here, the introduction of the intentional stimuli, um, you know, of course, incorporating this thing outside of just the typical scenario, uh, this, the scenarios because of that were extremely more challenging and they're getting into more complex topics um, as well as the oral boards to part in this phase um, of, you know, ACLS implementation, whereas they were doing static cardiology, they were in dynamic and 12 lead interpretation. Um, so I feel like it was pretty multifactorial um, as, as to why the stress would have, would have increased there. Some issues that we encountered uh, with the study is that it was a total of a nine month period. So from August 21 to March of 22, we had actually tried to initiate the study on an EMT cohort before recognizing um, that just the uh, 
EMT course wouldn't allow, I don't think, enough time to collect data uh, that we were looking for. But I do think that, of course, the SIT training is is certainly applicable to uh, to EMT training. We might look at this again and explore how that can be done. So the paramedic course began with 35 students, uh, 19 students initially participated in at least one phase of the trial. Uh, we did have a lot of uh, disenrollment. Uh, paramedic students are going to do what they do. And when they found, too, that this added additional timing and, you know, they started to have, you know, work work issues and it would delay them, um, we just had folks that would uh, voluntarily disenroll. Um, of course, it wasn't mandatory. A big thing was the logistics and the timing. So they're already setting up. We use the I simulate monitors and, you know, having to set up mannequins and getting their equipment ready. We found the store in these heart rate monitors in the um, in the monitors that they're using with their equipment, but they would also switch off providers, which means, again, is their chest straps that would require folks to have to go to the restroom, um, you know, to take them off. A lot of them, are, you know, we're getting sweaty, so having to wipe those things down and clean them in between iterations. There were just a lot of logistical um, issues that we encountered. So the study ran over the three modules that I mentioned, and then finding the subject matter and evaluator consistency was also an issue. So in discussion, so heart rate variability uh, was influenced by the demographics, the time of day, stimulant use against where we backed some of those folks out or asked um, if they would voluntarily step away. Um, the participant dropout, no control for the time of day and those sorts of things, demographic variables and, and, and uh, medical issues were also an issue. Um, and then the change between heart rate and mean heart rate to strengthen the signal for changes. We also had some technical issues uh, where batteries wouldn't work for a heart rate monitor or connecting them to Bluetooth, um, which we ended up having the students just run it to their own phones, but then collecting the data from that was an issue at times. Uh, we found that there are some non-significant findings that uh, there was maximal stress in phase three, which again, went against our hypothesis, minimal in two and intermediate two maximal in phase one. So a couple of things in summary is that we do absolutely think that it is feasible to introduce in pre school education, and I'm a big believer that you should, uh, especially OODA loop and tactical breathing, which takes very little time to teach about. Uh, and again, just little verbal cues can get them to implement it. They were most stressed during the intervention phase. Uh, the tactical breathing helped lower heart rate the most. Uh, and it's also true that the heart rate monitors um, that they have some potential in education and biofeedback. So it'd be interesting if you have that capability um, to see if you have any similar results. Before we talk about the application and where we start to wrap up, I want to give credit to uh, Dr. Matthew Cravens, uh, who was the initiator of this project, who's graduated his residency and is now functioning as an attending physician. Uh, Kelsey at the time, Kelsey Lena, who is now Kelsey Craver, uh, is pictured here uh, and was teaching um, surgical and needle crack atherotomies in, in one of our class days with our students. Um, she had the largest role in the subjective measures and the surveying. A uh, large majority of the data that I presented here today was uh, the objective findings. I will include uh, a link in the chat or get it out the email of um, the paper that we compiled together. And also want to give credit to Dr. Keegan Bradley, who at the time uh, was the attending physician in charge of residency, and Dr. Car Tyler Constantine, who's co-medical director of Center for Prehospital Medicine. Um, for uh, assisting with going through IRB approval and uh, really guiding the, the statistics and the things that were way above my, my, uh, my head and understanding, and lastly, myself. So on the last note, I really want to open this up in the last minute or so that we have for how do we apply this in the classroom, and some of you guys had great ideas already. There's no sandbox exercises. So again, my point to if you're going to pull a medication, then do it. Um, don't talk about it, be about it. We find still that they make errors and I'll ask them, what was the date on that med when they pull it up, right? And they'll, uh, you got me again. When I say, honestly, I, I, I wanna not be getting you at six months into the program. That's that's the standard of care. That's a level three. Um, so if you're going through that stuff consistency, consistently, then you wouldn't be making these errors still. Timing is big. So I feel like if we allow folks to sandbox and okay, I wanna have you, okay, you have it. The next thing, it never trains them on the timing. And I hear back from preceptors and FTOs, that's a major issue. Also, when things fail, that adds time. So how will they mitigate through this? And that, I think, is a big um, a stressor to a, to a new provider. Um, the next thing I, is I prefer is standardized participants uh, instead of using uh, mannequins when possible. Um, immersion. So I have a picture here of uh, the immersion room that uh, we were fortunate enough to get grant funding for, which is a uh, entire room uh, with, I think we have 
16 projectors in there that we can uh, project really anywhere in the world using Google uh, live map images and some preset ones um, that make students feel like they're immersed and hear a traffic accident or um, we can put them on location. Um, and I feel like immersion uh, is a huge key. Another thing anecdotally I've seen is playing a video of an incident, even just on my phone and showing them prior to so that they feel like they are in it. Um, I, I'm curious to know if y'all are doing that at all as well and how um, you're making things more realistic, as many of you said early on, um, is, is how you how you incorporate immersion. And it doesn't have to be a room like this. Simply, we found using a backdrop uh, of one projector in your classroom and just showing them that they feel like they're in that environment, a living room, uh, as silly as that is, or, or video. Um, and we noted, too, responses and heart rate and, and, and data. Um, I mentioned already the, of course, cultural, and then we also got some of the, the masks, I believe they're echo as well, to represent geriatric patients in different populations, bringing in uh, real kids in special populations. Uh, friends of ours have uh, a child with cerebral palsy who was willing to bring their child in and actually have them do assessments on them. So as realistic as you can make it, I think, is using real people whenever possible, real situations. In closing, the last few things I have is, is uh, one, another thing that I always mention in classes is um, the, the unfortunate case of Kitty Genovese. Is anyone aware of that name? It's talked about in modern psychology classes. Um, Kitty Genovese was a, a unfortunate soul that experienced a, a sexual assault. And uh, the premise of this is that for up to eight minutes, um, she was victimized while many onlookers from their balconies of a surrounding apartment complex witnessed it Yet no one called 911 for several minutes, up to eight minutes. And so the question I put out to my students is, why is that? Why did no one call 911 for that long? You're absolutely right. What, what is the psychology there? What was found? That, why wouldn't someone call? What's the premise? Fear, yes, yes, and no, I think that's probably a concept to it. I think someone else, that's it, that's the ticket. And it's the Good Samaritan effect is what it's called. So the Good Samaritan effect, and it happens all the times on calls. And so this is another thing. And again, I put respect on her name when I say it. And, and, and with full, you know, full respect, well, sometimes my students like, hey, get a get a glucose. I'll say who? And I'll say Kitty Genovese. I'll say that name. And they'll recognize, okay, it's Good Samaritan effect. Um, yeah, that's what's happening. So as silly as like the AHA videos are, you call 911, you do this or call and response. There's also another way I think that mitigates stress and puts in accountability. Yeah, absolutely. Diffusion responsibility. People respond better when they have buy-in. And then the last thing is a good debrief. I think is as important, if not more important than the scenario. I love to run corporate scenarios of a whole class and have just one or two providers in it and the rest watching and they're all taking notes and they always go through a debrief of what went well, what could have gone better and what was your takeaway? What will you change based on this? Really highlighting the mistakes and let them know that that's okay. We need to embrace that as educators and let them know, hey, this is your first time doing this. This is application. Thank goodness this wasn't um, you know, a, a real person or someone's family member that this happened. Um, and hopefully you learn from this mistake so you can get to that level four um, for predictive capability and failure contingency so that these things don't happen again. Um, last thing is just want to show references and I want to open it up. And I'm sorry, I think I ran a few minutes over for questions. I also have my email here um, to be mindful of your time. Please feel free uh, to give any feedback or thoughts, or I'd love to uh, to interact and hear about how ways that you're incorporating stress inoculation training um, and uh, employing culture and immersion. Um, and I hope you got something that you, you took away from this. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll take some time now to hear answer any questions. Did they help or hinder? I'm oh, following up on debriefs. Did you make the changes that had been discussed? Um, so it's, yeah, honestly, it's something I feel like that we've tried to incorporate. It wasn't a massive change for us as a result of the study. It's something that we had uh, had always tried to employ, but I think we learned more about it. Um, and in the surveys, you know, they said that they felt better and felt subjectively decreased measures of stress uh, during the debrief. And I think feel better uh, once they get to voice that and also feel heard that, again, it's OK to tell them sometimes you made the wrong decision, but you had the right reason. Um, and they, again, were making a decision. So we want to encourage that. Um, so I think, yes, generally it was uh, positive. Thank you all. Thank you for saying that.
could you share your levels again? Uh, levels regarding um, regarding the like phases of the um, study. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Lee, I see your question. So when you say levels, um, what what levels are you referring to? I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, the levels of mastery. So, uh, so for me, that's just loosely based off the concept of uh, of Bloom's taxonomy for education. Um, so, the four levels that we utilize the rubric is level one, which coincides exactly with Bloom's, is knowledge. And uh, the example I use for that is I say, "Hey, bag valve mask, right?" If I show you one, I go, "This is a bag valve mask." You repeat it, you have knowledge, but you have zero application, which is level two. Level two means that you know when to use a bag valve mask, right? How to use it. The nose piece goes on like this and how much you should squeeze knowing we're giving way too much, right? Um, level three is standard of care. When do I use that? I, I, that requires me knowing the parameters of normal respiratory physiology if they're outside of 12 to 20 or volume is decreased and that you would apply it the same way that any other technician would in that same circumstance. A level four, right, for that bag valve mask. So who would that be? It's somebody that um, recognizes they're coming out of a toxic gas environment or right now they're ventilating appropriately or they pulled out of a, a house, right? They've been burned and they already have predictive capability to not only have their bag valve mask ready, but also innovation equipment. That's that critical thinking person. That's probably a person that's been burned on that before uh, and that's where they get that learning. So that's, that's where our concepts are based on um, one, two, three, and four. So knowledge, application, standard of care, and then critical thinking. I hope that answers your question, Lee. <clears throat> Thank you. And yeah, without any further, uh, any further questions, again, please feel welcome uh, to shoot me an email. Uh, would love to, to meet some of you. I hope to get myself and my, my faculty to, uh, to a conference again soon. And I had to find out and give credit to the, the first person I heard that for because OODA Loop has been one of the biggest uh, game changers for me in my career. There's not a class I go to if it's a BLS CPR class or a brand new paramedic class that I don't uh, don't mention that and see positive results and, and good feedback from students. So again, thank you all again. Um, it was an honor and a privilege and I hope you all have a, a good rest of your day. All right, Thomas, thank you so, so much for being here today for your presentation. Um, it was clearly a big hit. <laughs> So everybody, um, I saw a question earlier. This webinar will be posted to our YouTube channel so you can reference it at any time. Um, I put the link to obtain your CE in the chat, but it will also go in tomorrow's follow-up email. And I will be sure to include Thomas's email in tomorrow's follow-up email as well, so that way you can reach out to him. And with that, I think that is everything. So I hope everybody has a great day. Thomas, thank you again. Thank you. And we are going to sign off. So I will see everybody next time. Thank you. Thanks.